Good evening, everyone. I'm Kristen Bodner from the AOPA Air Safety Institute. Thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, After the Crash, Surviving an Aircraft Accident. If you're having trouble hearing, please be sure to turn your volume up. Depending on your device, whether a desktop or laptop, the volume levels will vary. First, I'd like to mention that tonight's webinar qualifies toward AOPA Accident Forgiveness and FAA WINGS credit, so be sure to keep an eye out for a link that will be emailed to you tomorrow, and that will lead you to your participation certificate and WINGS credit. We'd like to thank all of our generous donors who make it possible for us to provide all of our safety education at no cost to you, including tonight's presentation. You can see more of our products, including online courses, videos, and safety quizzes at airsafetyinstitute.org. On the left side of your window, you should see a little black box with several controls. This is your audio control panel. It includes controls to reset and stop audio, refresh the page, adjust volume, and last but not least, a box to send us your questions and feedback. For optimal performance, we recommend that you use Google Chrome for tonight's webinar, and for iPad users, you may need to occasionally refresh your browser and click the Play button on the control panel. You can find other troubleshooting tips by clicking on the little question mark button at the top right. Our presenter tonight is John Collins. John is the Manager of Aviation Safety Programs here at the AOPA Air Safety Institute. He is a 2100-hour CFI and has been a Civil Air Patrol mission pilot and ground team leader on several actual search missions. He's currently a Boy Scouts of America Scoutmaster and Wilderness Survival Merit Badge Counselor. He enjoys camping and hiking and proudly prefers hammocks to tents. A couple quick notes before we get started. We will be monitoring your questions during the presentation and if we can answer them, we will address them at the end as time allows. Also keep in mind that this is a modified version of a seminar presentation that normally spans a couple hours but we will provide a link to additional information at the end. John, thank you for leading tonight's important discussion on increasing your chances of survival after an accident. And at this point, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Kristen. I appreciate that. Uh, just a quick overview of what we're going to cover this evening. We're going to talk about uh, finding, your, finding yourself, actually hoping everybody else finds you. Uh, First things first, some signaling strategies. We'll talk about shelter and warmth, water and food, survival kits, and we'll wrap it up with some key points and action items. Before we get too far into the presentation, I'd like to start off with our first survey. We're going to do three this evening. And the question is very simple. How many of you fly with survival equipment in your aircraft or on your person? We do have a number of answers for you to choose from. Every time I fly, any time I'm out of the traffic pattern, only on long cross countries over inhospitable terrain, or my particular favorite answer, isn't that what my credit card is for? We'll give you a few seconds here to uh, dial in your answers, and then we'll take a quick look at the results. Looks like about half of our, uh, our users are, are on, do fly with uh, survival equipment on long cross countries, and maybe uh, some of you also do it every time you fly. Uh, a few of you do it anytime you're out of the traffic pattern, and then a few of you just use your credit card. So let's get back into our slides and into the presentation. You know, nobody takes off on a flight and doesn't expect to make it to their destination. But as we know, things happen, and you may find yourself in inhos over inhospitable terrain, over remote areas. Uh, in challenging conditions, and rescue is not always quick. Uh, depending on how you've set up your flight, you may be waiting a good while before you uh, get rescued. Your main job as the pilot in command, in addition to successfully navigating to your destination, uh, in the event of an unscheduled off-airport landing, uh, once you've successfully brought the airplane down to the ground, uh, it's your job to uh, deal with the uh, potential consequences of an, of an off-airport landing. It really means two things, broadly speaking. First, you need to do uh, everything you can to make sure you're found quickly. And second, you need to have equipment and knowledge to help you and your passengers survive while you're waiting for that rescue. And I will tell you this, and I'll make this point again throughout the presentation, your number one tool resides between your ears. It's your brain. You need to make sure you are 
trained, you have training, you've done uh, some survival courses, you've taken some basic first aid training, you've thought about what's going to happen so that you can be prepared for what might happen. However, you can't prepare for it all. Uh, there are certainly uh, thousands of possible scenarios, and if you took along what you could possibly need for every circumstance, most GA airplanes won't get off the ground. Still, uh, you can cover your bases pretty well without adding too much hassle or weight, and you can cover the most likely situations without going too far overboard. Very important, the very first thing you want to do is make sure, though, that somebody can find you. And let's talk about how we can make that work for you. This seems pretty basic, but if nobody knows where you went, or maybe that you went anywhere at all, the odds of being found in a timely manner are very slim. Uh, there are a number of cases in the record books where folks went off and nobody knew they were gone, and it took months, sometimes even years, to find out what happened to them. Uh, obviously, having somebody following your every move is probably a pretty good way to uh, ensure that you have search and rescue efforts initiated. Certainly, if you're on an IFR flight plane or you're using VFR flight following and you're talking with air traffic control, if something goes awry, you're certainly talking to them. You can let them know immediately, but they also have a pretty good idea of where to begin looking for you. A VFR flight plan is also something that will be very helpful. Uh, it's simple but effective. However, uh, you do need to activate it. If you don't activate your flight plan, uh, they have an idea of where you went. Uh, if you activate it and you don't follow it, don't let people know about the changes, you're decreasing the chances that they'll begin looking in the right place for you. In search and rescue, our, our job is to eliminate the worldwide possibility of where you went and to narrow it down to the probability area of where we think we're going to find you. An informal flight plan is another good thing that you can use. Often friends and family are the ones who end up reporting aircraft missing. All things considered, it's probably better to go with a flight plan. Flight service won't get distracted and forget you were supposed to arrive at a certain time, for example. But if you make sure that your friends and family have the appropriate information, it's not a bad way to go. As I mentioned earlier, if you're already talking to air traffic control, you can let them know what's going on. And you can give them an update and uh, a location. They should have you possibly on radar. Um, but uh, if you're not talking to air traffic control, you might want to go ahead and make a broadcast in the blind on 121.5, the guard frequency. Most aircraft, particularly commercial service aircraft, are listening on that frequency, and they can hear you and uh, relay your message to air traffic control and get search and rescue spun up and get them out there for you. There's a pretty fair chance someone will hear you. In this picture is an accident that occurred down in the Everglades, and Coast Guard crews came in and rescued the pilot because he was able to make an, uh, a radio call as he went down, and they got out there fairly quickly. All that said, it is very difficult to locate a crashed airplane from the air. I've flown on a number of missions, both training and actual, with the Civil Air Patrol, where we have had a difficult time finding where a pilot went. And from 1,000 to 1,500 feet above ground level, sometimes down as low as 500 AGL, when we're ducking down to take a close look at something, what looks like it might be an airplane crash may actually be a pile of somebody's trash, a deserted vehicle, or some other oddly shaped thing out in the wilderness that you think is an airplane, but actually turns out not to be. So you do need to give yourself uh, every opportunity to uh, be visible and give search and rescue other clues so that you can be found. As an example, here in Maryland, we did have a state police helicopter go down a few years ago. It was near Andrews Air Force Base. In fact, you can see the runways there in the picture. They were in contact with air traffic control, and they had, were equipped with ADSB. Um, however, uh, when they went down, it took people two hours to figure out where they were. Now, and you can see there's certainly a lot of residential encroachment around the airport. It's a heavily populated area. 
um, the weather wasn't too good, so uh, it did take them a while to find the site, and they uh, they finally were found. But it was it was in an interesting example of how uh, things can go wrong, even when you think you're not in the wilderness. To help out with that, you can use locators, and uh, we'll talk about some various types of them. First of all, we have our standard ELT on 121.5. Uh, they are uh, pretty good. Most aircraft monitor guard, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the fleet is already equipped with them. They do have some cons, though. Um, there is a tendency, uh, particularly some of the older ones, to give off false alarms. Um, it doesn't always activate, and it can result in a wider search radius. 406 megahertz ELTs. They have fewer false alarms, they're more accurate, they're quicker to get the information out, and prices have been uh, going down. So that's a, that's a good set of pros for them. Um, a GPS upgrade to it can be expensive, um, but uh, that will certainly aid in search and rescue finding your location a lot quicker than having to try to fly against a radio signal. Um, they do have similar vulnerabilities with respect to the antennas. Um, if they are broken off in a crash. Personal locator beacons and electronic, or excuse me, emergency position indicating radio beacons are also uh, good options. Uh, they're very effective. They're easily portable. Definitely easier to upgrade and many times more inexpensive than an ELT. However, you do have to manually trigger them. Now, EPIRBs are the marine version of an ELT, or a personal locator beacon. And many times, the way they're mounted on a boat, they're in a bracket. If the boat sinks, when the EPIRB hits the water, it's activated by the water and uh, begins to broadcast the signal. Um, any of those, if they are mishandled, uh, can go off inadvertently. And I've flown on several missions where we've had to find somebody's EPIRB that they tossed into the boat cabinet and threw under the uh, overpass next to the marina and we're up there at 2 a.m. in the morning circling, trying to figure out where this ELT is coming from. Cell phones are another option that you might, uh, might want to take a look at. Certainly, uh, you want to turn cell phones off before flight, although if you're using them in flight for navigation purposes, um, you, know, you may go through battery life. But um, you can do that. ADSB out is another option for you, and certainly commercial service providers such as Spot and Spider Tracks are uh, good options. In fact, uh, as we were putting together this, this webinar, I received an email from a member uh, in Kentucky, and uh, James uh, wrote and told me that in 2012, he crashed a trike in a wilderness area in the Teton Mountains at 10,000 feet. It was July, but there was snow all around the crash site, and the only discernible feature was a game trail 50 feet away that was frequented by grizzlies. The crash occurred at 6.30 p.m., and the light was fading. Now, rescue helicopter crews have a quote-unquote pumpkin hour after which they can no longer land in the mountains, and it was fast approaching for him. He had broken his arm in the crash and was probably in a bit of shock just facing the consequences of his situation. Fortunately, he had one piece of equipment that any pilot can afford and which he can attest can save the day in this situation, and it's the Spot Satellite Messenger. Now, he's not affiliated with the company, but he did want to let me know that that had saved his life. He fired it up and learned later that the local rescue services received a call with his location within 15 minutes. Within an hour and 10 minutes before the pumpkin hour, he was picked up by a rescue helicopter. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do. James is really a big fan of the Spot satellite messenger and highly recommends it. So certainly something you might want to keep in mind as you're putting together your own personal survival kit. Once you're on the ground, there's, a, there's some things that you need to take care of fairly quickly, and we call them first things first. First of all, you want to minimize your fire threat. Master switch off, fuel off, mags off. Hopefully you've already taken care of that as part of your pre-landing uh, checklist. But in case you haven't, make sure that they are turned off and you, get, you reduce the chance of a spark that could ignite any sort of fuel or fuel vapors that might be in the crash. Next, you'll want to get out of the aircraft. 
you may need to kick your way out. If you weren't able to prop the doors open before you landed and they buckled and bent, you're going to have to take some time to get your way out of there. You may even need a canopy knife or other instrument to, to make sure you can get out of the aircraft. Once you're out of the aircraft, make sure you bring out your survival gear with you and get away from the aircraft. You'll stay with the aircraft, but you don't need to necessarily be right in it immediately. Once you've done that, a basic assessment of what's going on is required. Take inventory. What do you have? Does anybody have any injuries? Do you need to provide immediate first aid treatment? Do you have an idea of where you're located? Do you have uh, an understanding or can you figure out how long it might be until you are rescued? And can you survive until then? What's your most immediate threat? Is it a life-threatening injury? Deal with it first. If not, is the weather closing in? Do you need to build shelter? Deal with that. If not, can you, do you need to communicate and signal to get yourself found? Then go ahead and deal with that first. When it comes to medical needs, your options may be limited. And this is where I would recommend a uh, training in first aid and uh, perhaps even a wilderness first aid course. Uh, do you want to administer first aid and make your, your injured folks comfortable? And you want to focus on getting them help? Certainly first aid and CPR courses are important. There are a lot of them that are now online. Uh, you can take them online and get certified. You can also take them in, in uh, person. As I mentioned earlier, a wilderness first aid or a wilderness first responder course for those of you that fly in remote areas or, or over remote areas may be a very beneficial piece of training to obtain. Your passengers also need to know where equipment is located. What equipment do you have on board? How do you use the radios? How do you turn on the ELT or the PLB? How do you use a satellite phone if you have that? Where is the survival equipment located? You can give them all that information by using the ASI Emergency Equipment and Rescue Information Seatback Card. You can download that from our website. You can see the, uh, the address there at the bottom of the screen, airsafetyinstitute.org slash passenger briefing. There's also a video that accompanies that. Make sure that's part of your briefing. Give them the opportunity to feel like they have some control over the outcome of the flight. So. How long is it going to take you to get rescued? If it's good weather, if you were on an IFR flight plan, if you got a mayday call off, it could only be a few hours. If it's bad weather, you're in a remote location, it could be a number of days. And if there's no flight plan, you're in a remote, a remote location with no communication, it could be a long time. Hello, Wilson. So, you're in the wilderness, you've landed, you think you know where you are, you want to go get help, unless you know help is nearby, or if the crash site is dangerous, stay with your aircraft. Uh, you know, if you have a dilemma where you have uh, badly injured people, you're uninjured and there's no sign of a quick rescue, do you go looking? a good question and that's going to be situation dependent. If you can do it, might want to consider it. Maybe you'll find help. Maybe you'll get lost, but if you do leave, make sure you leave a note. Let people know where you're going, when you left, and where you think you're headed. That way if search and rescue finds your aircraft and they find your injured passengers, they may or may not be in a condition to give them good information. So you need to make sure that you leave good information for your rescue party. Bring a means of navigation, whether it's a compass or cell phone, GPS, whatever. Use, use some navigation. Bring your chart. Um, smartphone GPS will work without a cell signal, even though the map portion might not update. So a good tip for that is to actually download the maps for your app rather than relying on a data connection if you've got enough space on your phone. Even without the maps, if you can get the GPS to spit out a lot long, you can use it in conjunction with your paper charts.
as the pilot in command, it's your job to stay positive. Attitude is key for yourself and for your passengers. As the sign says, never, ever give up. You need to be the optimist, and you need to lead by example. Um, there are many, many, many stories of survival out there where it was a positive mental attitude that carried the day and got everybody through the situation. If you can stay positive and you can keep your passengers positive, there's a very good chance you'll be rescued and you'll come out of it okay. Let's take a look at a survival myth. I'm going to play a video for you here. Okay, the first myth we're going to look at is one you've undoubtedly heard before. They say you should always wear a hat when it's cold because 80% of your body heat escapes through the top of your head. Now, this one's been around forever, but is it actually true? Talk it over and let me know what you think. All right, let's take a quick survey, find out what you guys think about that. True or false, 80% of your body heat is lost through your head. Go ahead and get some answers in there. Go ahead and send you your results. And we'll get back to our videos here. And let's take a look at that answer. All right, so this is one of those facts everybody knows is true. But it turns out it's actually not. Or at least, it depends on how you look at it. Here's the deal. There was a study back in the 50s that actually did show the vast majority of heat lost in cold weather was through the head but only if the person was wearing insulated clothing and their head was the only thing uncovered. Seems sort of obvious, huh? Not quite what the myth seems to say. The truth is, even though there is greater blood flow to the head, there's nothing really special about the heat loss there. If you were to strip down and run naked through the snow, you'd be losing heat pretty much equally over your entire body. So we're calling this myth partially busted, or bursted. But your mom was still right to yell at you for not wearing a hat. Okay, mom is always right. So let's go through to our next section. We're going to talk a little bit about signaling strategies. There are a number of ways that you can signal. Uh, and we had mentioned earlier about uh, using the ELT. Now, one thing to keep in mind with the ELTs, satellites are no longer monitoring 121.5, so it's going to be other aircraft that will hear that. However, you can also send other electronic signals, such as uh, uh, aircraft radios or handheld communications. Um, you know, if the radios are working, go ahead, broadcast on 121.5. Somebody should be monitoring guard. Hopefully, they'll hear you. They can relay the message. Try your cell phone. If you don't have a signal, leave it on. The fact that it's searching for towers, the company can take a look at that, and Search and Rescue has a way to talk to the companies to get them to do the research and, and let them know where the phone might be located. You can also use visual signals. Remember, with visual signals, you definitely want to be uh, seen, so you have to have a, a good contrast. If you're in a wooded area, you need something that's bright, something that maybe is shiny, uh, that's a, a good contrast with the green foliage or the brown foliage behind you. If you're in snow, you want something that is dark, something that can be seen. Uh, a general rule of thumb, if you're, if you're tramping out or laying out uh, letters such as SOS, a 1 to 6 ratio for width to height is a good way to make your, make your letters 1 yard by 6 yards. And remember, it's tough to see stuff from the air, even if you're only 1,000 feet above the ground. Make it big, make it large, make it contrast. Um, you can use other means such as uh, space blankets. And after dark, lights work well. Portable strobes, even the aircraft lights are all good things to take a look at. Now, this is a little bit of an extreme shelter, and I think these folks had probably some uh, some time on their hands to build this survival shelter. Uh, yours is probably not going to look that good, but let's talk about shelter and warmth. First things first, though, you want to dress for egress. Uh, about a dozen years ago, I was checking out a new staffer in one of our aircraft, and it was a January day. We went out to the flight line. 
I was dressed business casual, low cut shoes, uh, you know, a ski jacket on, hat and gloves, and my flight bag. She was wearing a long quilted parka, had boots on, hats, gloves, and she had a bag in addition to her flight bag that she said when I asked her it contained her survival gear. And I asked her, I said, look, we're, we're going up, we're flying in the, uh, in the pattern, we're just doing a, a little checkout ride, what's up? She said, well, I learned to fly in North Dakota, and out there, we always dressed as if we were going to have to spend time on the ground. And it's a good rule that I've carried with me ever since I learned to fly. And I thought about that, and it's an excellent way to do that. You definitely need to pack for the climate below. Even if you're flying from Michigan down to Florida, you don't want to get on the plane in shorts and flip-flops and go down somewhere in Tennessee in the mountains dressed for the beach. You definitely want to have clothing on that will keep you warm and keep you safe. That's your first layer of shelter from the weather. And have your passengers do the same thing. And if they balk at it, just tell them, well, the heater's broken in the airplane and you're going to need to stay warm anyhow. Clothing has three jobs. It needs to breathe, it needs to insulate, and it also needs to block the elements. And we're going to talk about dressing in layers here in just a moment, but uh, that's definitely the best way to do it. If all you're wearing is a big puffy jacket, and that's the only thing you have for, for warmth, um, eventually you're not going to be warm anymore. You have no way to get warmer without doing something drastic. So dress in layers, and we'll talk about that here shortly. Your greatest threat when it comes to cold weather is hypothermia. You want to keep your core temperature warm enough that you're able to function. Very common scenario is it's you know, a 40 degree day, it may be windy, you're not wearing the appropriate clothing, and because you're trying to survive, you've been trying to build a shelter, or you've been trying to gather firewood for signaling fires, or you've been working furiously to provide first aid to a passenger, you may be sweaty from exertion. That's a, a prime time to you know, get hypothermia, to get chilled, and to start to lose your core body heat. So dress in layers. Um, you can shed them as necessary, but you know, the best way to do it, you want to have a base layer that is a, a wicking material, wool for those of you that can tolerate it, synthetics for those of you that can't. Those are very good. You know, silk is good. Uh, it will carry the sweat away from your body and allow it to get out to the other layers and to evaporate without actually cooling you. Your middle layers will provide you with insulation. Um, uh, you know, you wear fleece, you can wear wool. You know, you don't want to wear cotton in a cold weather situation because cotton absorbs the water and it traps it. It takes a long time for cotton to dry out. And so it can, it can uh, chill you rather than keep you warm. And then your outer layer or your shell layer should be windproof, waterproof, preferably breathable so that that moisture that you're perspiring or expiring will, will get out. For a cold weather shelter, the aircraft is often the best shelter. It does offer ready-made protection. And it can be relatively easy to see if you keep it free from snow. But in some cases, you may want to use the snow to insulate yourself. When weather gets below 10 degrees, aircraft have a tendency to act as a cold sink and actually can make you colder rather than keep you warm. So if you don't insulate it, maybe lay branches over it, build snow over it, it will, um, it will not provide you the protection that you're hoping for. What about fire? Well, fire can be critical. And my recommendation is that you should always have several different ways of starting a fire with you. If you don't carry a lighter or if you don't have matches, then you're going to have to resort to some other method. You could use gasoline and a spark of battery. Um, you definitely want to do that in a very controlled situation. You don't want to do it where uh, it can flame up at you. And the best thing to do with gas is use it to soak other material and light that, and not just light a puddle of gas or drop gas into an already lit fire or smoldering fire. Those of you that uh, have done this before with a hatchet and flint or a rock or you know a knife and a ferro uh, steel uh, magnesium rod, you can shave that and you can use that to light a fire. Uh, I will tell you, working with Boy Scouts, that is probably one of the toughest things for them to learn is how to build a fire and to light it without without using 
uh, matches or without using a lighter, but to actually have to figure out a way to make that spark and to get the tinder to flame. Speaking of tinder, there are three types of fuel that a, a fire needs. To, to start with, you need tinder, which is small, easily burnable, easily lit stuff, dry grass, bird's nests, um, leaves can be useful, Sm very, very small, tiny twigs and sticks, uh, cedar shavings, bark. You want to slowly work up from that. Once you get that built and flaming, then you can start to add kindling, which are sticks about the size or width of your finger or pencil. Um, you need to have a lot of that. So when you go out and gather your wood, gather more than you think you need. We recommend, in the scouts, we recommend that you have a, a hat full, baseball hat full of tinder to start the fire. And then you'll need an arm full of kindling and then a stack of fuel, which is wood that's about the size of your arm, a stack of fuel that's at least knee high. If you're going to be there a while, you're probably going to want a lot more than that. So you have to go out and drag it out there, bring it back to your stuff. As, it's, as we say, fire is great, but it takes energy. Getting it started, finding and hauling the wood, you can overexert yourself, and you can put yourself in a situation where you're actually creating more harm than good, and you may be better off without it. In hot climates, your main health issues are going to be from exposure and dehydration, and again, maintaining your core temperature. You don't want to overheat. So when it comes to the clothing, you don't want to strip down, although you'll be tempted to do so. Keep yourself covered. Definitely protect your head and neck. You want baggy, loose, layered clothing and light-colored fabrics. In a hot weather environment, cotton may be a good material to wear because it will, like I said, it will retain that water and with uh, any breeze over the material, it will keep you a little bit cooler. But again, in hot climates, at night, when the sun goes down, it can sometimes get very, very cold, particularly in the desert at night when there's no cloud cover, it gets really cold. And the, the temperature variations are such that you'll be wishing for a warm overcoat. For shelter, in the day, you want to stay out of the sun. At night, you want, like I said, prepare for cold. Big temperature swings, you might even want to flip over your space blanket from the reflective side that's keeping the sun away from you during the daytime to the inside of the shelter so that it reflects your body heat back at you and keeps you warmer. Let's talk a little bit about water and food. Generally speaking, you can only survive for about three minutes without air, three hours without maintaining your body core temperature, three days without water, or three weeks without food. So which is the most important thing to look for or to work towards? We certainly want water because water makes up 70% of our body. 85% of our blood, 80% of our brain is water, 75% of our muscles are water, 90% of our cells are water. If you don't have water, like I said, you could go a few days at most, and if you're in hot conditions, it'll be a lot less. You need about two and a half to three liters of water a day. One of those is just used for exhalation. If it's short, if water is short, you don't have a lot of it, don't ration it. Drink what you have, but don't guzzle it. Sip it, you know, enjoy it, savor it. When it's gone, it's gone. Work to get some more. Your main goal is to minimize your loss of water. Ration, ration sweat, not water. Avoid exertion and exposure and rest during peak heat. Let's take a look at another myth. This one about eating snow. OK, time for another myth. There's a rumor floating around out there that you should never eat snow to hydrate yourself. Why? Well, according to the myth, your body uses more water in the metabolic process of warming the snow than you're actually taking in. So what do you think about that? What do you think? We have another survey here. True or false, eating snow will actually dehydrate you. Go ahead, take a few seconds. 
answer that question. And the results are in. Very interesting. We'll, we'll share those with you. We're going to take a look at the answer here. All right. So it turns out that this particular claim about snow eating is false. It will not dehydrate you. What it will do is lower your body's core temperature because of the energy required to warm it up, which is a very bad thing in a cold weather survival situation. Also, since fresh snow is mostly air by volume, you have to eat a lot of it to get much water. Now that's not to say that it's never okay to eat snow. If hypothermia isn't an issue and there's no other source of water, it's probably okay to eat in small quantities, but in general the best thing is to melt it first. So we're calling this myth busted, but not because it's a good idea to eat snow. Especially the yellow. Nope, I swore I wasn't going to make that joke. Okay, so that myth is definitely busted. Back to our slides here. Cold will inhibit your thirst, okay? Um, I can tell you from going on a number of cold weather campouts with the scouts and the Army, Civil Air Patrol, you don't feel like you're thirsty, but you really are. And it's very easy to get dehydrated in cold weather. Your body still needs the water, even if you don't think you do. And again, don't eat the snow. Melt it first. So you want to have something in your survival kit that you can use as a container to melt the snow. And it could even be, oddly enough, a plastic bottle. But uh, you, can, you can do that. Warmer water is better, particularly in cold weather. But uh, you can do that. Another thing that you can do to find uh, water, particularly if you're in an area where you don't have snow, or you're not near a stream, uh, let's say you're in a desert or in a hot weather environment, you can use condensation traps. The most commonly used one is the uh, hole in the ground with a plastic sheet over it, a container at the bottom of the hole, a rock placed in the plastic sheet to weight it down, and usually some vegetation placed in the hole along with that to generate some moisture. In extreme circumstances, you could even urinate into the hole, not into your container, but into the hole, and through the evaporation process and condensation process, you can purify that urine and get some water out of it. Another way to do that is if you're in a wooded area uh, and you're not near a stream, you can tie plastic bags over the ends of trees, both deciduous and coniferous trees, and they'll generate up to two gallons of water per day over about three days. So you can, you can get some good drinkable water that way. Another thing to consider is that uh, digestion takes water. If water is short or in limited supply, don't eat. But if you must, try to avoid protein and fat because that takes a lot of water to digest it. Carbs use a lot less water in digestion. And for those of you that think you're going to forage for food, I would recommend getting some training in uh, eating plants, deciduous plants, or eating wild plants. Um, sometimes plants look very similar, but they may have very disastrous outcomes and different outcomes. Uh, you want to be sure what you're eating is, in fact, going to be good for you and isn't going to kill you. And if you decide to do that, there is a method that you can use to take very small bites and to watch over time to see what the reactions are before you just go ahead and gorge yourself. If you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can eat it, then go ahead. Let's get into survival kits. Let's talk about that. This is probably something I could geek out on for you know a number of hours, but we don't have that much time left. But let's talk about what you need. Love? Well, no. Dwight tells us you need water and rations, which is true. But you also need a lot of other things as well. Preparation matters. And you can't cover every contingency. But like we said, key items can put you way ahead. And 20% of the items that you think you need for any emergency can help you in 80% of the situations. As a scout, I always go out into the woods with my 10 essentials, map, compass, sunglasses, and sunscreen, extra clothing, a headlamp or flashlight, first aid supplies, fire starter, matches, knife, and extra food. Sometimes it helps to think of these in terms of systems. You know, maybe a system for navigation, a system for sun protection, a system for insulation, that would be your extra clothing, illumination, first aid, fire, repair kit and tools, nutrition, hydration, and emergency shelter. A basic kit, a good basic kit would include waterproof matches or a lighter, 
cotton balls soaked in Vaseline or fire starter, a small saw or a hatchet to help you gather wood or cut your way out of an aircraft or build a shelter or dig a hole, 20 to 30 feet of light rope or cord, very useful for lashing things together. You can use that in first aid applications. You can use that in shelter building. Depending on the, uh, the rope or cord, you can use it as fire starter as well. Space blankets, again, you can use them as a blanket. You can use them as a shelter. You can use them as a signaling device, a signal mirror or a lamp. Not only can you signal with it, but if you're trained and have practiced, you can use it to light a fire. Utility knife. Here you see a, a basic uh, a multi tool. And certainly, those are very helpful. If, even if you only have a, a small folding blade knife, that's better than nothing at all. You can certainly do a lot with that. Garbage bags are an excellent multi use item. I take a number of them with me every time I go camping. Not only do they make good improvised pack covers during rainstorms, it's an excellent poncho. It can be used as an emergency sleeping bag. You can use it to, to uh, waterproof your shelter uh, or you know, put garbage in. Water purification systems are important. Here you see uh, iodine tablets, potable aqua. You could also use a life straw. You could use a, a, any kind of a camping filter, uh, other sorts of tablets. You can even boil water. Unless you're very certain that your water source is, in fact, pure, I would recommend that you purify it, at least by boiling, but you can also use chemical or other filtration methods to do that. Even if it's just running the water through a, a reasonably clean t-shirt into a receptacle, you've knocked out a bunch of the, the tasty, crunchy stuff that's in there, and you can get water that would be drinkable. Compact high-cal. Long life food is important. Um, certainly you can go for MREs, although I've had them. and You can live on them, but they don't taste that great. Um, some of the newer ones are better, but you can also go for things like beef jerky. You can use uh, energy bars, that sort of thing. You're definitely going to want something to carry all your equipment in. Uh, it could be a small backpack. It could be a survival vest. It could be a fanny pack. Uh, it could even be an empty coffee can or an empty paint can. Uh, those have the added uh, ability to be a water storage and purification receptacle. If you've noticed anything as we've gone through this slide, everything we've talked about for the most part is a multi-use item. You want to maximize that. You know, the more multi-use items you have and know how to use in the various applications, the less weight you're going to take in a penalty in your weight and balance. And remember, you do need to take this into account when you are doing your weight and balance. You want to make that part of your equipment. You may have a kit that you take with you everywhere you go, but sometimes you go different places and you have different things to worry about. Maybe it's the weather, maybe it's the terrain. So if you're in a long flight over the desert, maybe you add some more water to your kit. If you're in the mountains in the winter, maybe it's uh, extra sleeping bags or clothing that you can use to survive in. Let's take a quick look at first aid kits. Again, like a survival kit, home building is best because you can configure it to what you need and what you think you're going to need. You can put your own medications in there. You can put your own uh, things that you're familiar with in there. So your components, you certainly want to have some gauze. You want some bandages in there, some kind of splinting material, whether it's a SAM splint or some other uh, stiff material that you can use, tweezers, antibiotic salves, anti-nausea medications, aspirin, ibuprofen, antihistamines. Those are all good things to put in your first aid kit. One thing to think about, one thing to keep in mind, uh, and it's a common issue, you can build a kit and you could ignore it for 10 years. But that's not really a good thing to do. Medications expire. Food expires, water packets expire, you know, things, things can break, batteries can leak. So you want to make sure you've got a chance to take a look at it. Since your aircraft goes through an annual, you're going to probably have to bring your survival pack out of that as it goes into the annual. That's a good time to do your annual maintenance check on it. If you're a renter, 
Just set a reminder on your calendar and do that. Now, we had a question earlier about um, is it uh, a potential legal issue or a problem to carry a bear-proof or a wolf-proof weapon, in other words, a, uh, uh, something like a high-powered rifle or a pistol while traveling over various state jurisdictions. One thing that I would, I would recommend to you is that you pick up a publication that deals specifically with traveling with firearms. There are a number of them out there, very good, and they will give you the specific state laws. You do need to take a look at what those are going to be over the jurisdictions you're going to be flying over. Um, I would not pack it without having an understanding of what's going to happen, even if you're not expecting to land in the states where you're going to be. So do take a look at that and do make sure that you understand the rules as you, uh, as you overfly states. When we talked about replacing batteries, checking food expiration, if you have flares in your kit, which is a good way of signaling, flares do expire and make sure that you take out expired flares and put in fresh ones. So let's wrap this up. We've been going on here for a while. First of all, your job as pilot in command is to make yourself easy to find. To <coughs> badly mangle a quote from General Patton, let some other poor pilot practice his survival skills. Okay? But consider the possibility of a mishap when planning your route. Plan your routes for less, less, less inhospitable terrain. Give yourself a better out. Give yourself a better chance of being found. Bring clothing for the weather in the train below. And again, remember, it's generally best to stay with the aircraft. That's what I'm looking for when I'm out on a search and rescue flight. I'm looking for an aircraft. I'm not necessarily looking for people wandering away from it. I can see an airplane, hopefully, a lot better than I can see just a couple of people walking. Remember that water is much more important than food. And whatever you do, you know, take three ways of making fire, take two or three ways of purifying water and know how to use them. Do your best to keep a positive attitude. Okay? Don't be Pollyannish about it, but do maintain a positive mental attitude and understand that, yes, you can survive and get back to tell the story. Some action items for you as you leave this seminar, and I do appreciate you guys sticking with us. Put together your own survival and medical kit. Take a few moments, you know, look at the presentation. We'll have it recorded, and you can take a look at it later. You can also go on to our safety spotlight and look at the information we have there on survival equipment. But put those together and put them in the airplane or tick, put them in your flight bag so you can go out with you to the airport. Download the passenger briefing card and watch that video. Definitely consider taking at least a first aid course and uh, or take uh, a uh, wilderness first aid or first responder course. Download an app. Have it on your smartphone or on your iPad. Take a survival course. You know, the FAA offers a free survival course out in Oklahoma City at the, uh, at the CAMI office. They will, they will teach you in a one-day session a lot of these skills and give you some hands-on labs. If you don't want to go out to Oak City, look up your Boy Scouts. Look up your Civil Air Patrol squadrons. They'll be happy to talk to you about that. Even some FAA FISDOs might have uh, courses that they can arrange for you. Or go to REI. They offer backpacking classes. They'll teach you a lot of the skills you'll need to know to survive in the wilderness. Again, I mentioned our ASI Spotlight, airsafetyinstitute.org slash spotlight slash survival. You can get a lot more information about surviving after the crash. I want to thank you for coming. And I'm going to turn it back over to Kristen at this point in time. I think we might have a little bit of time for uh, some Q&A here. So take a look at that. Thank you so much, John. We did have a couple of questions that came in. Um, one was regarding beef jerky being high in sodium. Can you address whether that's a, a bad idea when you don't have much water on hand? Well, yeah, it is, it is high in sodium. Uh, beef jerky is a personal favorite of mine. I always take it camping, so uh, that might have been a personal bias slipping in there. But um, that, is a, that is a good question. And, uh, you know, with the sodium in there, um, yeah, you probably want to be careful with that, but uh, it also lasts a long time. So there's a little bit of a trade-off. All right. We had uh, another question um, about colored smoke grenades. <laughs> you want to be very careful when you're transporting pyrotechnics. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, yeah, you could you could have those in there if you're if you're very careful about transporting them. 
Um, you know, you do want to understand uh, the hazmat regulations, make sure that you're not going to put yourself in danger with those. Um, yeah, they can work. Uh, I think there are uh, commercially uh, prepared ones that may be uh, a little better for um, aviation applications, but um, if you have access to those smoke grenades, I guess you could use those. They are very hot when they when they uh, expel smoke, so definitely be careful with them if you're using them. Don't hold on to it, please. Right. Well, thank you so much. And, um, and we had just a comment uh, come in from Nicholas, and he just wanted to reemphasize that, um, you know, routinely training with your gear is extremely important. You can buy it and stow it, but um, being familiar with it uh, is definitely something that, that people need to keep up with. So um, we thank you all so much for attending tonight. Unfortunately, with just a few minutes left, we don't have time to open it up to more questions. Um, but I know that we had some more, so if you, uh, if we did not get to your question tonight, please email us at safety at AOPA.org. And again, we thank you so much for attending, and thank you, John, for joining us tonight. Have a great night, everyone.